Hi guys, welcome to my channel. I am so happy you came here today. As you know, I'm a family doc, uh, board certified in obesity medicine and some additional training in nutrition and functional medicine. I'm here with Dr. Dykeman. He is an amazing guy who was a guest on the Protecting Your Nest podcast. I really appreciate him because he and his family have faced a new diagnosis of diabetes type one and when they faced it, they didn't let fear uh, destroy their hopes. Instead, they did the opposite. They learned just enough to be dangerous and were able to figure out how do you make the blood sugars of a type 1 diabetic normal, uh, which is something unheard of in many of the conventional uh, clinics that you would attend. So, so I wanted to uh, be, you know, share this study. It was published in uh, Pediatrics. I have it in my hands. And after I kind of comment on this study, I want uh, Dr. Dykeman to just share any talking points he would like to. What's si exciting, and this study was done in 2018, it's entitled Management of Type 1 Diabetes with a Very Low-Carb Diet. And of course, anything that helps with type 1 is going to help with type 2. Um, some of the people in the study are very familiar, other than uh, R.D. Dykeman himself, uh, Dr. Richard Bernstein's in the study, and as you know, he is the author of The Diabetes Solution. I think the last I checked, he was about 89 years old, and he's yep. just doing his thing, healthy as they get. And yes, you can be a type 1 diabetes, a, di a person with diabetes and live a long life. Other people in the study, the uh, very well-known Dr. Sarah Holberg, uh, and she was with Verta Health, and she did a lot of great research before she passed. Nothing but yeah. respect for her. Dr. Eric Westman, uh, as you know, has been doing low-carb research since 2002, I think. So he's one of the gurus in the low-carb space. And others like Dr. William Yancey, Dr. Lugwit, et cetera. So, but let's, let me just give you a sense of why I'm excited about this study, whether you're a type 1 or type 2. Um, the objective was to evaluate glycemic control among children and adults with type 1 diabetes uh, who consume a very low-carb diet. That sounds like keto to me, Dr. Dykeman, <laughs> and uh, very happy that they were able to do that. Now, the methods, which kind of talks about you know, what they did, uh, it was an online survey, so it's more of an observational study. Uh, of international social media group. I think that was type one grit, I assume, right? Yeah. And uh, and basically those folk in that group are following the very low carb diet. They uh, looked at the hemoglobin A1Cs uh, as the primary measure. They also looked at the change in the A1C after self-reported uh, beginning of that very low carb diet. And, and they also looked at the daily insulin dose and any adverse events. And they confirmed the data. The A1Cs were confirmed in the uh, offices of the uh, participants, right. doctors, and medical records. So this is this is actually a very good thing because many survey studies don't do that. Now the results showed that 316 uh, respondents to the studies uh, were involved. Uh, the ages were interesting, and as you know, type one diabetes can be yet you can get diagnosed with that at an early age, sixteen plus or minus fourteen years, uh, duration of diabetes eleven plus or minus thirteen years, and uh, you know following low carb two point two years plus or minus three point nine years. And now this is very important. They said the mean carbohydrate intake was 36 plus or minus 15 grams. That's important because as you hear us chat about this briefly, uh, you need to know what they did so you'll know what you need to do. And But this is the thing that's shocking. And I've looked this up in the past. My wife's a type 1 diabetic. And shout out to my wife, Karan, and all she's doing to stay healthy as well. Uh, the mean A1C, when I look it up for a type 1 diabetic, is in the 8 plus range, right? And, and that's not a good thing. Well, in this uh, study, the mean was 5.6 plus or minus 0.66. Well, if you know anything about these A1C numbers, you know that 5.6 and lower is considered normal. You have a type 1 diabetic who has achieved normal A1Cs by following a very low-carb diet. The conclusion of the study is that Exceptional glycemic control of type 1 diabetes with lower rates of adverse events were reported 
in the children and adults who consumed a very low carb diet. Now, if that doesn't get you excited, this should be breaking news. And I am so happy to break the news with you today with Dr. Dykeman. So Dr. Dykeman, since you're a participant, you actually started uh, Type 1 Grit uh, Facebook group. Talk a little bit of, it, you know, any talking points or things you'd like to share for people who are checking this video out. Yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot to uh, emphasize about what you just said. And the, the first thing that, um, uh, that could use a little emphasis was that I think one of the chief criticisms of the, the paper was that it's an online, uh, it, the cohort is online. And uh, so immediately the critics want to throw that out the window. And the, the most criticism that we got was from the standard members of the diabetes industry cabal who push uh, grains and low fat diets on their patients for decades. And they pounded their fist on the table and said, Hey, this is an online survey, but you, mm -hmm. you nailed it actually in the explanation. And it, re and it requires some re-emphasis, which is that although the people were identified and they answered questions in their survey, one of the questions that they had to answer was who is your doctor? And do you give us the right to go ahead and look at your medical mm -hmm. records? Yeah. And, uh, so the, the blood sugars that were attained, uh, which is the main feature of the paper were verified by physicians re reporting. So it doesn't matter if these people were found on in an online group or not. Um, uh, and they were, they were a, you know, there was a cross section of ages and, and what we saw in the paper was that it didn't matter if you were two or if you were 82, uh, you, these people were all following the same diet and it didn't matter if you were recently diagnosed or you had been diagnosed for 50 years. Once you got onto the, uh, the, the very low carb diet and started to understand how to use insulin in that context. And we'll talk mm -hmm. about that for a second too. Um, uh, then normal glycemia was the path that you were on. A couple more points I want to make. So first of all, the glycemia was the big thing, but we measured a lot of other things too. We measured rates of hypoglycemia. We measured uh, rates of diabetic ketoacidosis. Why did we measure those things? Because two of the chief concerns about low carb diet is that uh, one, you're always going to be running uh, low blood sugars. In fact, it's the opposite. You're, mm -hmm. you're going to experience less hypoglycemia and much less severe hypoglycemia with a low carb diet because your insulin is predictable. Mm -hmm. The next important thing is the diabetic ketoacidosis. And there's a huge misunderstanding about uh, people who really haven't studied their biochemistry and physiology, which, which uh, lets them uh, think for some reason that having trace ketones in your blood is putting you at more risk of diabetic ketoacidosis. In fact, it's the opposite. What we found was less DKA amongst the type 1 gritters. And there's an, a reasonable explanation for that, which is... Mm -hmm. DKA comes along with high ketones and high blood sugars, and it indicates an insulin deficiency in the blood. The type 1 grit people are keenly aware of whether or not they've had a clogged pump or forgotten basal shot because they're not used to seeing blood sugar excursions of love above 120 or 130 or 140. If it got up to 150 or 160, they would think that something is wrong. But if you're on a high yeah. carb diet, those are pretty good blood sugars. So you never really know what your insulin status is. So not only were we able to show that there was normal glycemia, we were able to show that many of the common myths used to stop people from using low carb diets were incorrect. And the third thing that we showed, uh, well, there's two more things. The third thing that we showed was excellent cardiometabolic factors outside of A1C. Now we know that with type one diabetes, the number one most potent determiner, and this is coming from the ADA journals, not from me, mm. is A1C. There's no other better predictor of cardiovascular disease and type one diabetics. And type one diabetics are killed by cardiovascular disease at five to 10 times the rate of non-diabetics where it's the number one killer. So that's the, that's what you want to attack when you're, when you're treating a person with type one, you want to attack their A1C and get it low. That's right. So be, but besides that, the traditional factors of cardiometabolic health, like triglycerides and HDL and BMI 
-hmm. and even a uh, uh, number of a dose, a number of units of insulin every day, all trended in favor of the very low carb diet. Then the fourth thing is one of the chief criticisms you'll get, which is in my mind really a sign of potential food addiction, is people saying, "Ah." Oh, I can't eat like that. I need my sweets. I need I need to have a piece of cake. I need to have uh, my morning muffin. And uh, so you would think that the quality of life being reported, maybe these people are having flat blood sugars, but maybe their quality of life is really bad because they missed their, their bowl of uh, cereal or whatever. Not the case. People described their experience that it was a new lease on life, that they turned their type 1 disease in, into a condition. Uh, it minimized the amount of, of of daily management they had to do, and it and it provoked a, a hope for the future. Um, and they finally felt like they were in control of their their type one. So it was like the study was absolutely uh, amazing. It's the most important thing that's occurred in type one diabetes in decades. Yeah. Well, Dr. Dykeman. Um... If I were listening to you today and I had never heard of this study and I realized that 300 plus people were able to, as type 1 diabetes, right, was able to achieve normal numbers, I would just be amazed. So I, I really want to encourage people watching this to do what Dr. Dykeman said, which is let's restore hope that this is possible. And if Dr. Dykeman and his family and all of those people with type 1 grit, I want to encourage all of you guys to check out type 1 grit on Facebook. I want to encourage you to check out this episode of the Protecting Your Nest podcast. We're going to dive a little deeper. But if they can do it, then why not you? I, I am really excited that there's hope. Again, when you have a wife who has to live with type 1 diabetes, it's hope that even Dr. Hampton and his family uh, needed to have to restore hope because there were some nuances. Uh, one of the courses that you'll have access to and, and maybe get on the waiting list is the one that uh, Dr. Dykeman and his family offers through Dr. Eric Westman's group, ADAPT. So I want to make sure you're aware of all these resources and it's going to be a game changer. So check out the episode of the podcast. Uh, Check, you know, share this video with anybody that's looking for hope. This app, this this video short and the podcast are going to be game changers for people. And again, the same principles can apply to a type two diabetic. So I thank you guys for coming to this video. I thank Dr. Dykeman. And until the next video, continue to be safe, be well, and continue to protect your nest.